dear fellow horn players around the world. I am Nicolas Roudier, and I have the pleasure to welcome you to my presentation, The Horn of Lord Gaben Mozart, Investigation and Experimentation. In the historical performance practice field, one of the most exciting things about our instrument is the variety it has to offer. There are so many different horns, and I am fascinated by the search for the correct instrument for a particular style, period, or even for a single piece. As horn players, Mozart's concerti, which are written for his friend Joseph Lloyd Gebb, are the backbone of our repertoire. For a long time, I had been wondering how to play Mozart's music in the correct style, and there are plenty of written works on the matter. But sooner or later, my two obsessions, Mozart and the choice of horns, had to cross paths. What was the horn Lodgeb played when Mozart wrote for him? Is it very different from what we usually play? My preliminary investigations showed that we actually don't know much about it. My first goal was then to find out which horn Lodgeb may have played, or at least to get closer to it. From that question came another, inevitable. Does such a horn have an impact on the music? How does it feel? What does it change in terms of articulation, tone color, etc.? In other words, can the question what to play Mozart on answer the question how to play Mozart? I had found no testimony of such experiment before. So my objectives were, in a first phase, to investigate in depth which horn Mozart and Lodgett may have known, and in a second phase, find an original similar horn to play on and see how it feels and what it tells me about Mozart's music, and eventually record it, which had never been done before. I'm going to share part of my discoveries in this video. The evolution of the horn up to Mozart's time is quite rich, and yet still filled with mystery. If you have researched it like I have for this work, you certainly know that by the time Mozart wrote his horn concertos from 1781 to 1786, many different horns coexisted all together, and it is difficult to fill the gap between Baroque and early Romantic horn with certitude. However, thanks to surviving instruments, iconography, bills, etc., we have enough clues in our possession to state that fixed-pitch horns, without tuning slides nor crooks, were largely used, probably even preferred by players. Lodgeb was already playing professionally in 1754, and thus coming from the Baroque school of horn playing. He most likely played such a horn in the early days of his career, but it is very probable that he got to use crooks at some point. In order to find more clues, I investigated Lord Gap's life, and as you probably know, we unfortunately don't know much about him. However, I was able to shed light on very interesting connections he had with horn manufacturers and players that were not brought to the attention of the public before. First of all, remember that there was three very important Viennese horn manufacturers in the 18th century. The Leishamschneider family, mostly in the first half of the century, Kerner and Staatser. These last two were considered the best equally. At the term of my investigations, Lodgeb appeared to be connected to all of them. Joseph Lodgeb had a daughter named Rosina. Rosina's godmother was Rosina Stauzer, sister of the hornmaker Karl Stauzer. So we already have a family bond between Lodgeb and one of the most important manufacturers of Vienna. But it doesn't stop there. Stauzer Sr., named Thomas, was a horn player. And we know that he was friend and probably worked with Schneider Sr., the Stauzers and the Lashem-Snyders were two very close families. In fact, Michael Lashem-Snyder was Karl's godfather, and he most likely taught his art to him. Later on, Lashem-Snyder's business was continued by his son, 
before being eventually taken over by Karl Stotzer himself in 1767. Finally, even though I do not have strong evidences, there is a chance that Thomas Stotzer was Lord Gebb's teacher. There are more facts showing that Leschenschneider had quite an influence on the Stotzers and how strong their bond was. From there, we can easily make assumptions. There is no doubt that if Lord Gebb was connected to one or several horn makers, there is a greater chance he might have played one of their instruments. Stotzer's instruments were considered the best with Kerner's, and given how close his family was to Lloyd Gebb's, I think plausible that Mozart's horn player got to play one at some point. This is of course only a theory, but which should absolutely not be neglected. My lead on the Stotzer horns unfortunately stopped there, as there are no surviving horns made by him, but I hope that more will be discovered about them. I am leaving other connections on the side for now, and I'll be happy to discuss them with you, but just know that Lodgeb was also connected to Kerner and Ferber, either through family or business relationships. I would now like to move on to the most interesting part of my research, which is my practical experimentation on an original horn from the 18th century, as close as possible to what I have shown you earlier. It was a very ambitious project for a young professional like me. Museums are very protective about their collections, no matter your age or experience. Knowing perfectly that I could fail, I have sent letters to museums from all over Europe until I finally got the chance to play and record the original 1760 Kerner, of which Richard Serafinov is making copies based on measurements. First of all, a couple of things to note. To start with, I had never played Serafinov's copy before this experimentation. Even though I bought one since then, I will still speak from this point of view today. Second, my experimentation was organized with only a minimum of preparation and time. I wish the conditions had been more favorable and that I had more time to do things properly, but I had to do with what I had on the spot and did my best with it. I played the kerner using an Ager crook that I found on location. This was of course far from being historically appropriate. There is probably no way to know the exact original sound of this horn. However, this experiment was still enlightening. The horn had been restored and was in great shape. It was probably a fixed pitch horn that had been altered in order to be crooked. I was at first amazed by how small it was. The diameter of the corpus and the tubing and, of course, the bell. The bore was so narrow and the flare so small that I could only insert my four fingers inside. The rest of my hand had to stay on the surface of the bell. Because of this, I had to use a very different hand technique. On my French instruments, I am used to do all sorts of things with my hand, wrists and, and fingers inside the bell to play with different cutters and, and stopped notes. This was nearly impossible on the kerner. You could only open and close the bell with a very small movement. The technique was then limited, but also simplified in a certain way. In spite of its age, the kerner was incredibly light, accurate, free-blowing, with a bright and clear sound, more than any horn I had played in the past. Every natural harmonic was so centered and precise, it made articulation the main component of the playing, giving the horn a flawless definition. The emphasis was not so much on the vowels anymore, but more on the consonants, and the horn felt like speaking. Because of its accuracy and lightness, the kernel was also very agile and quick responsive. Allow me to illustrate some of these characteristics with a couple of excerpts. 
Let's start with the opening of the fragment of Horn Concerto in Mi flat, K371b. In this first excerpt, notice how centered and precise the C's of the first bar sound, almost as percussive as timpani, which I had indeed been encouraged to do sometimes, and it perfectly suits the solemnity of the overture. Also, the top A on the third bar is usually a challenging note on the natural horn, but on this scanner it was very easy to play and almost didn't require to open the bell. The second excerpt is the beginning of the third movement of the horn quintet. I would like to use it to demonstrate how easy and flowing fast scales felt on the horn. This was, in my opinion, one of the consequences of the very simplified hand technique. Easy scales and top A's combined, this excerpt of the last movement of the third concerto becomes incredibly easy and brilliant. In the next excerpt, I will draw your attention on the stopped A-B trill. Let's hear the end of the exposition of the fragment in E K 494A. This particular trill is often not so easy to pull off and make it audible without being too pushy. But once again, the kernel's free-blowing quality and the different stopping changed everything. Another quality of the horn that you're about to hear is that natural harmonics in the middle and low ranges were as precise and defined as in the top range. In this passage from the fourth concerto, first movement, listen to the low Gs and notice how centered they sound. This quality gave a completely different character to all middle and low range sections in Mozart's music, because all of a sudden they sounded much brighter and very incisive, as opposed to the darker male sound of a French or Bohemian instrument. Let us hear now the famous trills at the end of the second concerto. This usually is a tricky stunt. On the kerner, however, the quick response and perfect control of the instrument made this passage another easy and very enjoyable soloistic moment. So enjoyable, in fact, that I would dare to play the trills much longer, and the result was fantastic. I spoke a lot so far about precision of articulation, fast playing, etc. But legato is definitely something to be mentioned as well. The absence of gaps or roughness between harmonics made the playing as fluid as water. Listen to the beginning of the Romanza from the third concerto. This echoes an article written in the periodic Le Mercure de France in the second half of the 18th century about Lloyd Gibb's playing. In this article, Lloyd Gibb is said to be able to play an adagio as if he was singing with a tasteful legato. And this is exactly the effect that I was getting on the original kerner. Now that you've heard the 1760 kerner, I think necessary to have a quick talk about two other horns that were kept with it. Another kerner, this one dated 1810, 
and a 1721 Leisham Schneider. I was fortunately able to have a look at them, even though they were not playable. Notice how large the bell of the 1810 Kerner is compared to the 1760. It might reflect the development of the hand topic technique and how manufacturers responded to it, as well as the differentiation of high horn playing and low horn playing. On the other hand, if one compares the bell of the 1760 Kerner to the one of the Lachum Schneider, one will realize that they are very identical. This means that the 1760 Kerner still has an early type of bell from the first part of the century. Its shape is closer to the Baroque age than to Mozart's time. In other words, the perfect horn for Mozart's music would have a bell size roughly halfway between these two counters, and thus probably a more developed hand-stopping technique. It is now time to bring all these elements together. At the end of my investigation, did I find Lloyd Gebb's horn? Well, of course not. It's even more likely that there was more than one but I definitely got closer to what he and Mozart may have known. And I believe I came up with new elements that can be used later for further investigations. For instance, we know that Lodgeb probably played Viennese fixed pitch horns or terminally crooked horns without tuning slide, one of these transitional models like the one I played. On top of that, there is a chance that he may have played horns made by Kerner or Stauter. But I have a strong feeling about Stauter. I believe that if more were to be discovered about this maker, in particular about his connection with Lodgabe, it would be a major advance in our field. My practical experimentation on an original instrument also had some unexpected results. I had some preconceived ideas about how it would go. I imagined that the horn would show me what was possible to do or not to do while playing Mozart, and that I would come up with a whole different interpretation of the music. But actually, in the end, the horn and the music fitted each other perfectly, like they were made for each other, which is pretty much true. When played on a more or less relevant instrument, Mozart's music was suddenly making absolute sense. Everything felt easy and in place, and most importantly, within a style that totally matched the music. The light, easy, bright and clear sound, the accuracy and definition of articulation, in one word, elegance which is, I think, the key adjective for Mozart's music. Even when playing on another instrument, I believe we can learn from this experiment to search for this light, elegant style on any horn. All of this echoes a belief that I have, that the original instrument is the best urtext one can have. If one plays a piece on the instrument it was meant for, then the response is immediate, and the sense, style, sound, and heart of the music becomes obvious. Style is inherent to the instrument. I was able to record the fragment in EK494A with a string quartet in the Janáček Academy. The piece was completed by Anders Muskens. Although it is only an experimental recording and a lot of things could have been better, it is the first recording of a complete piece on the 18th century horn. You can hear an excerpt on my website or my YouTube channel. Thank you for your attention. I hope you found this presentation entertaining and enlightening. And I look forward to meet you online to discuss my research with you. In the meantime, stay safe and keep making music.